If you grew up in a dysfunctional household, the chances are you have a wounded child inside of you. The wounded inner child is responsible for much of the violence and cruelty in the world and is the cause of many addictions to people, activities, and substances. Join us as we explore in detail how the wounded inner child continues to contaminate our adult lives. day and welcome to the new series. I'm really excited about this series. I'm very grateful to PBS for putting this series on and allowing me to do it. It's a follow-up to the series on the family which uh, a lot of you have written me about and talked about and I'm very excited that it had the kind of impact that it had and I'm very grateful to public television for being able to put this kind of material on television. Uh, in that series, I talked about the family as a social system using the idea of general systems theory that everything is part of a whole and, and wholly a part and partly a whole. That we have a nervous system, a circulatory system, an uh, endocrine system, and yet I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a whole human being, but I have all these systems. Well, families are like that too. So the whole idea of family systems is a very new idea of emotional health and emotional illness. That nobody gets emotionally ill alone. That you, it's, it's always a contextual reality. Somebody has said it's a microsocial crisis. Emotional illness is a microsocial crisis. That, that somehow we've been affected by the system we're in. Now, I talked about family systems having rules, having roles that people play in it, and probably the most important thing that I underscored, and that I want to talk a little bit more about as we get into this new material, is the idea of rules. The rules that we have been using, I am going to suggest, are, are abusive rules. They're rules that have worked in the past. They have worked in times of survivalistic society, what Rianne Eisler calls the dominator society. Uh, those rules uh, at least worked. I don't say they were great or they were humane, but they worked. And, and what is a dominator society? It's that somebody has all the power. And in the past, it's been males. The beating of women and children uh, is an ancient and pervasive tradition. The rule of thumb was how big your rod could be to beat your wife with or your children with. So, so this, this idea of one person having all the power and, and other people subjugated to that power. And then the other part of the rule was the idea of uh, emotional repression. Emotional repression. In survivalistic times or when you're in survival modes, it's good not to feel. So, so we've come out of traditions, many of you may have grown up with this, I was, uh, don't be so emotional. Emotions are weak. That was also due in philosophically to the, to the rationalistic stuff. Hegel's phenomenology of mind, Descartes, I think, therefore I am. And, and all of these great philosophers uh, certainly had a, a, an intellectual place for reason, but they, they really didn't have an existential place. And so we've inherited rules that we've all been raised with. And my thesis is that no, nobody has escaped some kind of wounding from these rules. Evidence for that, Carnes, Pat Carnes at Golden Valley quotes 131 million addicts in the United States. Those are emotional problems. What we do with addictions is we mood or alter emotions. And so when we talk about work addictions and sex addiction and alcohol addiction and drug addiction, we're talking about emotional disorder. 
The other rule was obedience without content. And we saw that we saw the intrinsic potential of that rule at Nuremberg when these war murderers pleaded innocence on the basis of obedience to authority or, or Jonestown or Me Lai. These are, these are evidences. Or we've seen some of these public evangelical, evangelistic TV evangelist scandals where you have whole families that are in this obedience without content, whole groups of people that are dominated by obedience without content. This is very dangerous. It is enormously dangerous. I, I have talked to offenders. You're going to see in this series and in, in future programs, you're going to see people holding teddy bears and crying who were actually offenders. Uh, I've talked to offenders who tell me that when they go when they were acting out, they would go and look for the most obedient child. So, so we really must understand, and, you know, and I'm glad to be doing, uh, doing my, my series right here in San Francisco where a lot of the early outcry in the 60s, there was an outcry and a protest about this kind of idea that one people, you know, that, that, that one group of people have superiority over another group of people. Uh, millions of people have died to make the world safe for democracy. And, and uh, this is what we're talking about, is democracy. We fought and died for democracy, and yet we got families where somebody has all the power. And there's this hierarchy of madness. Uh, Daddy can get mad at anybody, Mom can get mad at anybody but Dad. You go right down to the youngest kid who can only torture gerbils or, or something. Uh, now, now, you know, I, believe me, I love animals, so don't, don't write me a letter about this. Uh, it's just a joke. I'm just making a joke. Uh, but, but the idea is that uh, this hierarchy of power, master-slave, repression of emotion, especially the emotion of anger and sexuality. So, so I want to talk about what happens when we grow up with rules like these. I've quoted Virginia Satira saying 96% of families are dysfunctional. People say, isn't that, you know, did you say that? I No, I didn't say that. I think they're all dysfunctional <laughs> to some degree. We're all, we all come out of the same set of rules. So how can we not be? And I don't care about formal logic. All the birds could be flying in the wrong direction. That's possible. That is possible. So, so we want to look at what happens when a child is abused. I want to read you something from David Muir, that abuse is not natural, he says, that it does not appear spontaneously without contact or instruction from others. This means, of course, that the person involved with abuse could have been taught other behavior, that there are options which have been denied that person, and because of the narrowness and the one-dimensional quality of the world of abuse, I will argue that abuse represents a loss of knowledge about oneself and of the world and a loss of freedom. See, see, that is what I argued in the family series, that, that children are wounded because children don't know what normal is. How would you know what normal parenting is? All you know is what is told you as normal parenting. And then when the pain is so great, you move out of the pain because it's too hard to stay in yourself when you're in that pain, and then you forget. And all children idealize their parents. You can't not do it. I couldn't have called a meeting and said with my little bags packed, Dad, you're an alcoholic. Mom, you're a co-alcoholic. I'm moving down the street. <laughs> I couldn't do that. I had to idealize them and make them okay and me, me bad. That's what children do. So, so the abuse lasts a lifetime. That's what we're understanding. And because the, the defenses that we develop are so powerful, they become automatic and unconscious. And by the time you get to be an adult, you forget you forget what happened. See, and the, the most dramatic uh, example of that is incest, where, you know, working with a woman in her 60s, she's suddenly starting to get to memories of her incest. That's not uncommon. So in the most extreme forms of abuse, sexual abuse, we know that people can forget for 50 years. They can go 50 years without remembering this stuff. And, and so we, we've got we've to get it that the truth of our childhood is enormously important to us. We better find out the truth of our childhood because the child will remember. 
Here's Alice Miller, who I really dedicate this, this whole series to, uh, because she has been the pioneering groundbreaker. The truth about st childhood is stored up in our body and lives in the depth of our soul, she says. Our intellect can be deceived. Our feelings can be numbed and manipulated. Our perception shamed and confused. Our bodies tricked with medication. But our soul never forgets. And because we are one, one whole soul in one body, someday our body will present its bill. The wounded and lost child is only in hiding. The, sto the soul is still whole in spirit. Ultimately, our deepest self will accept no compromises or excuses, and it will not stop tormenting or contaminating us until we stop evading the truth. What I want to show you in this first program is how the child contaminates our life, that wounded, abused child. How that wounded, abused child torments us and contaminates our life. And what I want to do to start that is to look at a questionnaire. Well, I want to draw you a picture first because I don't have a mobile and I'm going to draw a lot of pictures. I'm going to be drawing pictures of adult children in this program, and this is the way I draw them. That there's a great big person here that has a little child inside of them. And we're going to be looking at infancy and toddler and preschool and school age. And I'm going to suggest with Bob Subby, he made a wonderful chart where he showed that in the beginning of life, your private self and your public self are pretty, pretty much the same. But as this child gets wounded, this public self gets big and the private self just stays in there, can't come out of hiding. And so you keep moving on uh, with this tiny little child inside of you and this child doesn't forget, this child remembers all the pain and will continue to act it out or act it in or continue to contaminate your life. So this is a kind of a visual idea of what we're gonna do. Now, I'm going to show you some questions, a test, like a questionnaire. Did your wounded child get wounded? We're going to look at some developmental stages. So here's infancy. Have you ever had or do you have an ingestive addiction? You're overeating, overdrinking. Or have you been gotten in relationships with people who have that? I mean, I can take you in any public place and show you an eating or disorder. Get started. The child cries and we stick something in their mouth. So what are we, what's the message? When you're sad, eat it. When you're angry, eat it. Uh, mistrust of people. The infancy is about trust. Can I trust the universe? Einstein on his deathbed said there's only one important question, and that is, is the universe friendly? Uh, that's a pretty good, pretty good question. Uh, fears of abandonment. What happens to you when a relationship ends? Uh, when a marriage ends? So, of course, there's grief about it, but do you become suicidal? Do you feel like you can't go on if this other person doesn't love you? Uh, continual needs to be admired. We're going to talk about narcissistic disorder. Narcissus is the god that fell in love with himself looking in the water, his reflection in the water, and then he drowned. So we'll talk about a healthy narcissism. <laughs> Toddler, do you have trouble knowing what you want? Trouble asking for what you want. Fear of trying new experiences. You hide in your hotel room when you go on the vacation. You, you're, you're like a person who riding the bus backwards. You see life as it passes by. Fear of anger. You're manipulated by, you do anything to stop a person from being angry. Uh, manipulated by anger. Afraid of saying no directly, so you say yes when you want to say no, and then you lie and manipulate to get out of it. Preschool, trouble identifying what you're feeling. Thinking about feelings, knowing what you're feeling. Difficulty expressing your feelings. No models, nobody ever expressed feelings for you. So you don't know how. You found this out when you became an adult and got in a relationship. Because that's where this stuff manifests. You act on guesses and unchecked assumptions. Your husband asked you five years later why you've never cooked bluppity blup. And you said, well, I saw you at a party five years ago. Pass that up. <laughs> You think you're responsible for your parents' happiness. We'll talk a lot about that. If you're not a success, then they're not happy. Uh, you feel uncomfortable in social situations. We need to learn to cooperate in social skills in school. 
You're excessively competitive. You give in or have things your own way. That is, you either give in or you have to have it your own way. You won't try anything unless you know you can do it perfectly. Uh, have intense fears of making a mistake. Now, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be giving questionnaires in every, oh, in several of the programs that are coming. But these are just little guidelines to help you see if you got your childhood developmental dependency needs met. Remember, a child has dependency needs, which means you can't get these needs met by yourself. You've got to depend on somebody to get them. So I, I had uh, our people make up a banner here of the way that the child contaminates. This, these are some of the ways, not all of the ways, but some of the ways that the wounded child contaminates our life. And the first way is what we're calling codependency. And there's been a lot of maligning of codependency, but it's a very important idea. Because what it means is, is that we believe we can't generate happiness from inside. That, that you have to love me or I'm not okay. That I have to have money and prestige or I'm not okay. That, that everything is on the outside. In fact, one of the words I use for it is other-ation. Other-ation. I took that from a Spanish existentialist philosopher who said that, that human life is characterized by within oneselfness whereas animal life is characterized by other Asian, living always on guard, hypervigilant, always you know, having to hunt your food and, and always being guarded lest you're never unguarded. Codependency is a disease of the developing self. In those, those developmental stages, you don't get your needs met so your self doesn't develop. And, and uh, when you're being abused, uh, uh, you, you can't stay in yourself. See, see, I knew what my parents felt before they knew what they felt. I knew what they needed before they knew what they needed. That's what happens. You can't pay attention to your own internal cues. Now, offender behavior. I, I want people to I hope I can get it across to people that this, is not, this work is not about hugging animals, although you will see people hugging animals because we want to access the child ego state we want to touch the feelings of the child, that, that some of the most terrible behavior that is done uh, is, is because of the wounded inner child. I, I'm writing some men that are on death row right now. And one of the amazing things that came out of the family series was the number of criminals, of people that were in prison, who wrote me and saw that series and began to realize that they had been acting out in their offender behavior what had happened to them as children. That they had been doing to society what was done to them. That the original soul murder had gone without any kind of consequences. So offender behavior, and then another way to understand offender behavior is that we do to our children what was done to us, or exactly the opposite. I went exactly the opposite. I didn't have a dad. I never had a dad there for me, so I became the dad that I never had. See, my little boy, so here's John. Here's grown-up John, and he has children over here, and instead of the grown-up John parenting them, the little boy in me parents them. That is, I become a parent to them like I wished I'd had a daddy. And 180 degrees from wrong is still wrong. And, and my, my erring and my parenting was more about not putting enough structure because I had been overstructured or in some ways I'd been abandoned and then I'd been overstructured. So I'm going to compensate for that. And so it's enormously important that one of the worst places that the wounded inner child comes out is with your own children that as you go through these developmental stages, as you go through each stage, depending on whether you got your needs met or not, is what's going to determine what's going to happen between you and that child. So parenting, that's an enormously important aspect. Uh, I I'm going to talk some more about offender. Uh, the worst kinds of offender is when we beat children or incest children. And we know that in large numbers of cases, the people who beat their children or incest their children were beaten and incested. 
we know that the child in them is acting out exactly what was done to them. So, so that, that we will reenact scenes. In subsequent programs, I'm going to talk about how to redo these early scenes, but that these scenes get imprinted in the brain. And then we act them out, either as a victim or as an offender. Like, like I, I would have hated the thought of being an offender uh, 15 years ago, but I did offender things to my children. I screamed at my children, little bitty people with little, you know, developing central nervous systems, very beautiful, delicate human beings. Now, you know, you're, when you're going to hear a lot of stuff that you probably did to your own children. And, and believe me, my belief is you don't have a choice until you heal this wounded inner child, that you will act out or, as a victim or act out as an offender or you'll act it in. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Another way that this child contaminates our life is with narcissistic disorders. Every baby needs a face that loves it unconditionally. The primal scene of our life. In later programs, I'll talk about the importance of having our support group and that the healing of toxic shame is re-identifying with a face, is reconnecting with a face, and why it's important to be in groups because there are faces there. Uh, that that face needed to love you unconditionally. The only way you could know that every part of you was okay was by looking in that face and having that mirrored back. If you looked in that face and a part of you wasn't there, then that part of you split off, like your anger split off or your sadness split off or your parts of your body may have split off. And, 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 and they're not whole. I'm going to be talking about the spiritual wound. That, that you weren't loved for the very one you are. The very one you are. David Mura again. Here's a, a wonderful quote where he talks about, uh, the, he's talking about a boy who's been incested by his uncle here. The cry of the boy says, I want to be loved, to be known and cared for, to have my whole being acknowledged. In committing this act on me, you are telling me that I am nothing. I am an object. I am a tool. And I'm not even allowed to express my feelings about it. Once that cry is suppressed, and given the circumstance that it, it must be, the boy then may take that abuse as an act of love. And I'm going to tell you that as we look, as we look at the dynamics of the wounded inner child and think that people recycle this through their whole lives and keep picking people who abuse them, what that really means to me is that the child in there has come to believe that love is abuse. And that is one of the scariest things that I know about. Now, narcissistic disorder means that if you weren't loved for the very one you are, there's a hole inside of you. I call it a hole in your soul because I think there's something that cries out. Somebody might call it the witnessing self or the higher self. It's okay with me. I call it the soul. Yeah, there's some part of us that when we're being abused, cries out. It, we can't name it. We don't even have a name for it. We don't even know we have a right to, but we cry out. So when the child doesn't get the admiration, the unconditional positive regard that they need, that there's a hole in there, then how are you going to get that? You may go through your life trying to get people to admire you. Or, here's the worst thing, you get this child to admire you. If you have a child and you, you set it up so that they can never leave you, that they will always love you, that they will always express gratitude to you no matter what. Is that familiar to anybody? And that's what Alice Miller wrote about in the drama The Gifted Child. And you think it's great, I have this devoted mom. Uh-uh, be careful. I hope you do have a devoted mom, but be careful. You can have a, a mom that looks devoted or a dad that looks devoted who isn't really there for you but is there for their own admiration, their own narcissistic supplies. Now, another part is trust issues. This child, I, I haven't trusted anybody in my life. Uh, I, I look like a good guy people pleaser because I know how to do that act. And that was the act that I got into very early on. But a part of me doesn't trust anybody. 
a part of me, that wounded inner child, needs to control. You know, when I sobered up with my alcoholism, I found out 10 years later I was still controlling every situation I was in. I wasn't expressing feelings. I didn't know what my feelings were. Or I, I was either controlling everybody or I was gullible. I was investing in gold mines in Nevada and seashore in Kansas because uh, I liked the guy. I liked the guy. See, this is very dangerous stuff. And I'm telling you the pain that my gullibility, my wounded inner child has cost me a lot of money. <laughs> One of my buddies was telling about this water he gets. And it's supposed to take everything away. You couldn't possibly get arthritis or you couldn't get this if you drink this water. And I had this fantasy of this guy sitting on his couch laughing, going, hey, Myrna, fill the bottle up with some more water. I just had $400 more order. You know, like, how do we know? But, but this is something about that, that that's going to fix me. Uh, that's going to fix me. And so we get real gullible. The child doesn't know who to trust. Or the child doesn't know what to trust. I've already talked about this offender behavior, this acting out or acting in behavior. You can act out exactly what happened to you. Uh, if I had a mother that engulfed me, I will look for women that look, have the same positive and negative qualities in the hope that this time I can have a relationship without getting engulfed. If you had a daddy that never showed you emotion, or you didn't have a daddy, then you may keep looking. That little boy, little girl, keeps looking for daddy. That daddy may be a person. Daddy may be a church. Daddy may be a political party. Daddy may be a company that you give your life to. May be a guru that you give your life to, very dangerous to have that little child making the choices. So you act out, and it's actually a holistic thing. The child's trying to complete. See, the child's unfinished. This little child is needy. This little child is needy. This little child is incomplete. I quit drinking December the 11th, 1965. And 10 years later, I was still compulsive. I was still insatiable in some ways. I was still acting out compulsively, addicted to excitement and adrenaline rush because I hadn't cured this wounded inner child. I hadn't healed my wounded inner child. Now, you can also act the child's pain in. You can do to yourself what was done to you as a child. You can do to yourself. I've had clients who hit themselves in the face, bang their head on the car when they made a mistake, cut their wrists, acted all the rage and disdain of their parents in. That acting in could come out in sadomasochistic fantasies. Let's say this child was bonded to a mother, let's say a boy child is bonded to a mother who has unresolved incest issues. So she's got sexualized rage. He's going to carry that sexualized rage about his masculinity. And so he may have fantasies of being demeaned by women, of being masochistic to women. See, that's not nature. That's learned behavior. That comes from being violated. So it's enormously important that we understand that you can act it out or you can act it in. Now, magical. This little kid's magical. This is a kid. This is Winnie the Pooh and Tigger too. This kid's magical. And I, I think about all of us getting rocked to sleep with fairy tales. Fairy tales are wonderful. They're wonderful. But you need to grow up and understand that they're a right brain phenomena. They're about symbol. They're not... They're not to be taken literally. Suppose you have a wounded child. You may take that magic literally. And, and for example, Cinderella, whose mother had to be an alcoholic because she talked to herself in the mirror. <laughs> no, that's Snow White. Snow White. Uh, and then she lives with these seven asexual dwarfs. And then she sets her out, herself up with the hope that a necrophile will stumble through the woods at the right time. A guy that likes to kiss dead women. 
and Cinderella goes to the party, doesn't even get the guy's phone number. <laughs> and waits in the kitchen for some banana with the right shoe <laughs> for the next 40 years. I mean, this is scary stuff. Waiting, waiting, are you waiting for your ship to come in? I had a buddy tell me, well, my ship pulled in, there was nothing on it. Uh, <laughs> so be careful about waiting, waiting, trying. Here's another piece of magic, trying. Well, I'll try. Try to get up out of your chairs. Try to get up. You don't try. You either get up or you don't get up. <laughs> but you don't try. And all of us who do counseling, you know, I, I, I used to have a little bell and I'd ring it when people would say try. Because we know they're not going to do it. Trying is dying, we say in recovery. Trying is dying. It's magic. And then magic is Jack and the beanstalk finds these beans or these pills that you can eat like tuanol and secanol and nembutol and, and all these wonderful red and yellow and Christmas trees. And boy, when I found those little babies and ate some of those, whoom, the whole world, magic. See, addiction, ingestive addictions are about magic. The sadness goes away when you eat the food. You fill your stomach, you have a tight gut so you don't feel the anger anymore. Uh, suddenly your mood altered, self-sex. Your mood altered. You don't have the pain anymore. What a analgesic. Magical. That wounded inner child keeps that magic going. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous to live our life according to ma uh, a magic. I if I could just get married. There's one. There's one. <laughs> if I can just get married. And little girls are told that the right man will come along. Now, you wait for the right man, darling. The right man will come along. And, and, and those movies that I grew up with where you're supposed to know, you know, like androgyny, that we were all bisexual and we were split in half. And when you see your other half, you'll know. Uh, I grew up with those movies, you know, where someone looked across, you know, boom, here they come, you know, across the room toward each other. And I would go to parties and I would go, well, I think that's her, you know. And then I'd go, no, no, wait a minute. I, I think that's her. <laughs> no, wait a minute. I think this. And I'm about 19 before I'd leave, so not, not a good idea. Uh, now, probably the worst place that the wounded child is wounded is in relationships. The place that codependency, toxic shame, adult child issues or when you get in a relationship. See, this wounded developing self, you don't know you've got this problem until you get in a relationship as an adult. That's where it manifests. And, and so that's how we came to understand this, the adult children of alcoholics. We began to understand that just growing up in an alcoholic family had damaged you, whether daddy got well or not. Uh, and, and that it was going to manifest in your adult relationships. See, because what's going to happen? So here's Johnny, and he goes to the party, and here's Guinevere over here, and she's at the party, and he looks over, and you have one of these, <gasps> <gasps> it's hyperventilation. <laughs> and it's, it's a, called a vibe, vi vibration. It's an energy vibration, and there's something real about it. Uh, that we just, you just, we just spot that person, you make that eye contact, and uh, there may be a little uh, kind of hyperventilized, uh, but, but it's like, wow! And uh, we think it's, it's sexual or something. Often what it is, this little boy is seeing the exact pattern that he grew up with. Like uh, Terry Garsky in some of his, his lectures talks about dating four suicidal women in the same year. Now, that's not easy to do, folks, to, to, to go into a crowd and look and let's say, let's see, who is suicidal here? Now, I, I mean, I don't want to make fun of this because it's a terrible, painful reality we're talking about. But how do we know? How can we find somebody right at our level of dysfunction? See, see like if I, if I was in Russia and I didn't know how to speak Russian and I saw an American tourist, what would, what would you, wow, let's get over here and let's talk. Here's somebody that knows my language. And that's, what, that's exactly what happens with dysfunction. 
That's exactly what happens. We pick somebody that knows how to talk our language. We pick somebody that meets us at our map of woundedness, if you will. That is very frightening. Now, when you're courting, it's, it's this little boy and little girl. It's acute. It's wonderful. That's why, that's why we're beginning to understand we've got so much love addiction. Because you're just out of your gourd when you're doing this. I mean, this is wonderful. It's the most wonderful feeling in the world to be in love. You go back to primal bonding. You go back to gazing. You go back to that face, that primal scene with the face. And, and, and people who, who this fits their morals, uh, the sex when you're in love is oceanic. It's like going back into the Big Bang, uh, the beginning of time. Uh, so, wow! Now, that's courting. That's in love, and you're courting. Then you get married. What's going to happen? He's going to say, you're supposed to be my mother. And she's going to say, you're supposed to be my dad. And so how are these two kids, this 180-pound three-year-old, this 120-pound three-year-old, did you see the movie Big? Uh, oh, what, what a great movie uh, of, of a child living in an adult body. I know exactly what that feels like. <laughs> I know exactly what that feels like. I, uh, I, I, I talked to some financial people. You all have been buying so many books. Uh, I have to go talk to financial people now. And, and I don't know duck about finances. And I'm sitting there, and these guys are talking about this. You know, you've got to leverage this and get you a duck, duck, charitable truck. Duck, duck. And I am absolutely do not understand one word that they're saying. I'm pretending like I do. I'm taking notes. Uh, you know, it, it's like, but this little kid's going, when do we get out of here? You know, uh, and, and it's like, that's what it feels like. So when these two people try to get married and, and have a life, what you're going to hear is you never and can't you ever and you always and I'm here for you and you're never here for me. And they're, they're both insatiable. You know, we don't have relationships. We take hostages. That's a saying we have in recovery. Uh, you know, it's why I used to say, show me a happy person. I'll show you somebody who isn't in a relationship. <laughs> Be because it is so troublesome. It is so troublesome. Now, obviously, obviously we want to be in relationships. We can't live without love and caring and to have somebody that you matter to. So wonderful to have somebody that you matter to. But boy, these, these two are going to have a tough time. And these two kids are non-disciplined. That's the N in our little chart. They're, they're non-disciplined. Uh, what, what does that mean? It may mean that he's obsessive compulsive uh, and he has to have everything in its place and this, this, house, this house needs to be perfect. Uh, you know, he, he uh, absolutely demands that every speck of dust be cleaned off of this house. And she's kinesthetic. She kind of drops her pants wherever she is. Uh, she likes a house that's lived in. Uh, she, li you know, she thinks that well, a floor is for clothes. Uh, <laughs> uh, See, I, I, I'm wondering why, why so many people are attracted to Roseanne. You know, it's like, wow, uh, because I think there's this whole thing. Anyway, uh, or, or she may be very impulsive. See, see, discipline goes one way or the other. A healthy discipline is a balance. And all throughout subsequent programs, I'm going to be talking about balance, the importance of balance in our life. Aristotle wrote about this in his, the Nicomachean Ethics, 400 years uh, before Christ or whenever Aristotle lived, but he wrote about balance, the golden mean. Not all or nothing, but balance. How important balance is in life. That nobody's gooder than they're badder. That, that people are both and. And that somehow in a relationship we've got to accept that there's going to be boredom and that the person will pick their nose on occasion uh, when we're not looking, when they didn't think we were looking. Uh, I, I didn't think women went to the bathroom for a long time. Uh, that, that was an amazing thing to figure out. Uh, uh, it was very depressing, too. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so, so it was like uh, we, we've got to accept each other uh, the way we are. Now, probably uh, the thing that I've talked about the most in the family series is addictive behavior. 
And my belief is that addiction, of course, ingestive addictions, can have a genetic predisposition. I am a genetic alcoholic. There's no question about that. That when I put alcohol in this body, something happened to me. I believe that some obesity has genetic factors in it and that there are genetics, but I want to make it perfectly clear. In 25 years, I have never seen a purely genetic addict. I was, ran the Palmer Drug Abuse Program in Los Angeles for four years. I was involved with it for 15. I've been involved in recovery for 25. I believe that there is a training for addiction. And that all genetics tell you is what kind of addiction you might have if you get the training for addiction. And the training for addiction is abuse. That's what the training for addiction is. When, when I'm a little boy and I'm standing there and someone can slap me across the face and I cannot speak. Now, I am a human being with absolute dignity. We have fought and died for democracy for the social equality of every single human being. What happens to that child? That child is standing there looking up at somebody that's five times his size, five times his weight. That would be a 17-foot, 9-inch tall, 800-pound giant. What would it feel like to be slapped in the face or pinched or jerked or be yelled at or to be told to go to your room and stop that crying, I'll give you something to cry about? And what are, you, what are you sad about? There's nothing to be sad about. What, what are you learning? You are learning about power, control, secrecy, and especially if it's something sexual that happened to you, or you're in a family that has very rigid boundaries where nobody can talk about what happened. Nobody talks about the dirty linen in this family. In fact, we look the other way. We're so loyal we don't even notice we stop noticing that the emperor has no clothes or that daddy sleeps on the porch frequently and we're told he has a bad back. That's why he sleeps there at 2 in the morning. And we believe that because, what, this is all you know. You, what you grow up with you think is normal. So, so this child is being taught secrecy, fear, can't express emotions, so the numbing of emotions. This child is being taught power and control and distance that these are the basis for a relationship. This is how you honor your parents. So, so what is that a setup for addiction? Think about what an addiction is. When that, when that alcohol hit my stomach, I had power. The acne went away. I wasn't afraid of girls anymore. Uh, I could express my emotions. Uh, uh, it wasn't, a, and I had a relationship. I had a relationship with alcohol. I had a relationship with drugs. And any addict will tell you that we had relationships. Now, people say, well, that's not me. I wasn't an alcoholic, and I don't have an eating disorder, although 50% of the population does. But what about mood altering through activity? You work all the time. You're going to see a videotape segment later on in this series of a gal that is sobbing as she does her exercise talking about the fact that her daddy, the only way she knew her daddy lived there was he left treats on the counter every morning in this workaholic family where she never saw her father. He had no time for her. See, children know that what you give time to is what you love. You have no time for me. See, so, so a mood alteration through activity, that could be sexual rituals, that could be buying addictions, uh, that could be, food, you know, that could be acting out with gambling. Or you could mood alter your feelings like you could rage to cover up your fear like I did. Or you could worry all the time, get addicted to worry. You could get addicted to joy, so you drive everybody crazy. You're always smiling when you talk about death and things like that. You're grinning and people want to <laughs> knock you in the nose. So it's very, very dangerous. I mean, these addictions, and I think we're taught these addictions. And I think if we want to deal with 131 million addicts, we're going to have to get off of this, let's get the cocaine pushers, and we don't need to get off of it, but let's do some other stuff. And let's understand that this stuff is fostered in families through abuse, and that the rules that we've been using that we call normal rules are abusive rules. Now, uh, thought disorders. These children, ch all children, absolutize, all or nothing. 
Uh, you, you, you give me ice cream and take me to Astro World. I remember going to Astro World with my kids, buying balloons and bears and, go, you know, and, and four hours where you're looking at your watch, praying that this thing will be over with. And finally, it's over. They're going to close the amusement park. And you're walking out with balloons on each arm and teddy bears, and they say, let's go to Bastion Robbins. And you say, no, 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 I can't take another thing. And they say, I hate you. <laughs> See, it's all or nothing, all or nothing. Now, I'm going to show you how that manifests in adult behavior. America, right or wrong. That, that's all or nothing. Uh, thought disorders. Uh, people sitting on a plane behind me, and the woman's looking at a, at a, at a vacation guide, and it says... Uh, uh, Alaska, uh, no, uh, Australia. And she says to her husband, oh, look at this, honey. Wouldn't that be fabulous? He says, what are you showing me that for? Don't you? What's the matter with you? Uh, I've worked my ass off. Uh, you, you keep throwing this up. But she never said anything to the guy. She just showed him these pictures of Australia. He heard it as a direct attack that he was inadequate. Shame-based people do this a lot. But you hear everything is inadequate. Awfulizing you know, you don't get on the airplane and say, this is the safest I've been all day. You, you see the wing on fire. Uh, you exaggerate things out of all proportion. So thought disorders are, are a common part. They're a common part of the wounded inner child. Felt thought. I remember getting, going through this guide. I was going to buy the, the right car, the car that, that had the best performance record. And uh, I, I spent three weeks looking for this, and I'm driving along. I looked at when I saw this convertible, and in 30 minutes, I bought the convertible. <laughs> that was little John. Uh, that was my wounded inner child. Now, now, the last part of this little chart on contaminant is emptiness. And I call that the spiritual bankruptcy, that the child has been wounded, the child has been toxically shamed, the child is an object of contempt to himself or herself, so that there's just emptiness inside. That's what we keep trying to fill up with our addictions. I thirst, I thirst, I thirst. Go to a bar and listen. Listen to the, that poor little child in there. And you can't get enough alcohol, and you can't get enough sex, and you can't buy enough clothes to cover up, and you can't get enough money, and you can't get enough love, and you drive people crazy. You drive people crazy because they, the more they love you, how much do you love me, do you love me, do you love... See, it's that wounded little child. And so we've really got to be willing to understand that until I heal that child, I'm going to be insatiable, that this is the root of compulsivity, and that I put the cork on the bottle December the 11th, 1965, but I hadn't healed my compulsivity because I hadn't healed this wounded inner child. I had just behavior-modified alcohol. Uh, I had just changed. And, and, and this, you know, I, I don't want to let people off the hook who don't happen to be alcoholics. Take a look at your own life. Uh, and what do you do to mood alter with? You can watch television to mood alter. You can eat to mood alter. You can starve to mood alter. When I was in the monastery, I used to fast all the time. And man, do I know about the endorphins that come from fasting. Uh, so I understand anorexia and, and what the mood alteration is of that and the mood alteration of bulimia, vomiting out the shame. Uh, so, so we've got to understand that there's a wide range of behaviors that we have been trained to have, and, and that these behaviors are about our spiritual emptiness. Uh, toxic shame is spiritual bankruptcy. Codependency is spiritual bankruptcy. Why? Because spirituality is about an inner life. It's about a lifestyle, that I am choosing my own life, that I am in charge of my own life, that I'm expanding my life and I'm making my own decisions. Remember, Joseph Campbell talked about finding your bliss, doing what you want with your very own life, doing what you want with your very own life, not for codependent, wounded child, adult children. So, so it's enormously important that we go on this journey. And I want to read you a poem of a person in one of my workshops. I get wonderful poems. I'm going to read you a another wonderful poem later on in this series about the abuse that comes from playing baseball, a little five-year-old boy with his dad. Uh, but this is from Lynn Davis, and she says, I received your letter of 729. I appreciate your response, and you are welcome to use my poem, Lost Child, in any of your presentations. You shared yourself with humor and compassion and showed me so many possibilities. 
lost child was the first step toward turning a childhood of violence and abuse into hope and promise. Now, what she writes in this poem is what I see us doing in this series, in the programs that are going to come. Uh, I'm going to be talking about healing this child and finding wholeness and having this child in our life as part of our life, that our adult will be there and our child will be there. She writes, In the darkest of times, I stand at the edge of that cold blue blanket and wonder if it has taken your breath away. And I cannot hear you in the whispers that had followed me since we were lost to each other. But then it's fall when our time's colors were most brilliant. And I promise that if I see you again, I will cradle you and stroke your soft round face and wrap us together in red gold and spin ribbons around us and sail us from that splintered song to a place where we are precious where we breakfast every morning on sweetness and light. And the sounds of the night are sleep lullaby, where everything we see and hear and touch and smell and taste is part of that wonderful adventure we promised to take together. When we were together, we promised that. And we will bathe in the warm, sad silence that was between us for so long, and we will feel everything and everything we feel will weave soft, magic fab fabric around us and keep us safe and warm. And we will be a child together. Now that just moves me so deeply. And it's the journey of finding the child that I can have this child in my life, that I can be the adult I am, but I can know that I have a little boy, a precious little boy, that lives with me, who is full of love and spontaneity and tenderness and believes in life and trusts life and is not afraid of life and loves to explore and adventure if he's just safe, if he knows he's safe. So in the weeks to come, the programs that, that we're going to do in this series, I'm going to be talking about original pain, the kind of work we do uh, in our treatment center, uh, I'm going to show you some very powerful, powerful segments uh, of that work and how, how people, when they can express those feelings, when they can get into a safe place, you're going to see a person work on their anger and a person work on their sadness from their sexual abuse and a, a man work on his desertion by his father. See, all of these things are soul murdering. Uh, we're going to talk about ways to access the child, exercises that I do in my workshops, where we reclaim the infant child, where we write with the non-dominant hand letters to our parents and, and get in touch with the feelings we had about not getting our needs met as children. In one of the programs, I'm going to have people writing a fairy tale about their childhood, once upon a time, and I, I'll, I'll share some of my fairy tale. And when people read that fairy tale to each other, it accesses the feelings of that child. You see, see the child was, was there, especially in the first seven years, as magical and non-logical and lived more in a world of felt thought, like a hypnotic trance. And so it's, it's very important that we know how to access the child. And then the whole goal of this work in, in this series is to get us to empowerment to get us to the place where we can have our power and include that resilient, spontaneous, courageous little person in our life that I'm going to call the wonder child. And I want to read you a quotation. This is from Robert Fulgham, the best-selling author. He says, I know what I really want for Christmas. I want my childhood back. Nobody is going to give me that. I know it doesn't make sense. But since when is Christmas about sense anyway? It's about a child of long ago and far away, and it is about the child of now and you and me waiting behind the door of our hearts for something wonderful to happen. Now, I hope in the programs that come that you will experience the incredible wonder that you can have by reclaiming and championing 
your own wounded inner child that's been waiting for you for a long, long time. Good job.